Thank you, Volania Brothers. What a blessing that was. Amen. You know, singing like that chases the evil ones away. Amen. They can't stand to be around where God is being praised, and that was a wonderful praise message, brothers. Amen. Thank you again. <clears throat> Why are you here? Have you been paying any attention to the state of the world? Think about our economy. The last I heard, $18 trillion in debt. Could you run your household that way? Look at Greece, going, what's going on over there. I heard that uh, the people of uh, China lost $37 billion last week. And China is the one that everybody thought was just on top of everything. We've seen the fall of the Russian dynasty, if you will. The world's on the edge of financial collapse. Consider the violence that's going on in the world. Genocide everywhere. Iraq, Somalia, Nigeria, just to name a few. I mean, the atrocities that are being performed by ISIS are sickening. Morality is just in the dumps. You, you can't turn the television on unless you have one of the Christian satellites to watch because the Everything that's on there has sexual innuendo and garbage in it. They're what's going on with the gay agenda and everything. There is just absolutely no morality out there anymore. Natural disasters. We've had the floods right here in our state, and we turn around and look, and all over the Midwest, just in Kentucky, they just had floods this week. Tornadoes everywhere. Natural disasters are coming on strong. <coughs> the, the, the wound of the first beast of Revelation 13 is healed. We combine all those and we know we are living in the last days. These should force us to ask some questions, the first being, am I ready? Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, you know the message you have laid upon my heart this morning, and I pray that I will be in the background and your spirit will be in the foreground. I pray for your spirit's presence here to open the ears of the hearers so that if there's anything in this message for them, they will take it, heed it, and follow it for your glory. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> you see the title of my message this morning. You might think it's kind of strange. Why are we here? I heard a pastor talk about this about 30 years ago, and I thought it was strange when he brought it up. But you know, what's interesting is there are different reasons for different people to be here. Probably not in this church, but if you went to any of the uh, churches around the capitals, of our states or, our st or over in Washington, D.C., you would see that there are people here for political status because their counselors have told them to get elected, it's good to be a churchgoer. You've got to be spiritual. And so they follow that counsel. And that's the only reason that they're in church. I know that when I lived in Arkansas, Bill and Hillary were told, you guys have to get around, go to church, and you also have to have children. They didn't want to have any children. So they, their poor daughter had parents that didn't really want her. 
But political reasons is one reason people are in church. Another reason that they're in church is business connections. Now, I don't know about here, because our church is kind of small, but I'm sure over in Keene there are some people that are there only so that they can make better business connections and grow their business. They get in and gather around and network. They do things of that nature. Another reason people are in church is social interaction. Many people are in the churches to just have some fellowship. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if that's the only reason you're there, there's a problem. I know I worked with Adventist singles, and every time we'd go for an Adventist uh, a single weekend and go to a church, they'd think it was all because of just uh, looking for a spouse. And that wasn't what our emphasis was. It was fellowship. But a lot of people have that mindset, and that's the only reason some people are in church. What about this one? Are you forced to be here? <laughs> Ask your children. You're in my house, young man. You're in my house, young lady. You'll go to church with me until you're old enough to be out on your own. So some of these young people here are forced to come into church, aren't they? But we don't want them to feel that way. We want them to know the love of Jesus Christ, and we want them to be here so that they can learn more about Jesus Christ. But that doesn't change the reason that they're there. When I taught early teens and youth out here, I know of several times that a child got to be 18, moved out of the house, and they were away from the church because they were forced to be here. They weren't taught in the household about love, and they didn't realize the love of Jesus and the importance of that. There are some people here who only want to satisfy parents, that grandma and grandpa are here, so I'm going to come to make them happy. Mom and dad are here, I'm going to come to make them happy. But they aren't here because they really want to be here. Why are you here? There's another group, and that's those that are here for insurance purposes. They've heard about this Jesus Christ. They've heard about the, the chance that they could go to heaven. They don't really believe it, but... If I go to church, I'm going to go to heaven. We've had people on the church books that don't want their name to be taken off the church books, but they haven't come in years because they think their name on the church books is their ticket to heaven. But these things aren't going to get us to heaven. We're going to go take a look at the parable of the sower this morning. Turn with me to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. I shouldn't have jumped ahead on that one so quickly. Matthew 13. Now this parable is in all three of the Gospels. We're going to read the one in Matthew 13, but it's also found in Mark 4 and Luke 8. And because I'm going to be jumping back and forth from those, after we read here, I'm going to put the verses on the screen to make it easier for you. Matthew 13, we're going to start in verse 3. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. 
Who hath ears to hear? Let him hear. Now, <clears throat> the first thing we have to realize is who is the sower, and I've put it up there for you already. Jesus is the sower, isn't he? In the person of the Holy Spirit, he sows the seed into our hearts. He's the one that's out there doing the work for us. Now, what is the seed? The seed is the Word of God. Absolutely, it's the Word of God. And he tells us that it's the Word of God in John 6, 63. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. His words give us life. Did you ever stop and think that every breath you take, every beat of your heart is a gift from him? that we need to be thankful for. And his words are what has drawn us here. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 38, paragraph 2, it says, Every seed brings forth fruit after its kind. Sow the seed under the right conditions, and it will develop its own life in the plant. Receive into the soul by faith the incorruptible seed of the word and it will bring forth a character and a life after the similitude of the character and the life of God. Is your life being changed by God's word? Is your goal to have your life the similitude of his character? You know, Mrs. White tells us that Jesus is waiting for his character to be perfectly reproduced in his people. Then he will come. Are you on that path? Now let's go into our parable. And this time we're going to jump to Mark and see who are those by the wayside because we have been blessed. The disciples didn't understand. And Jesus told the disciples, and by telling the disciples, we get to see that. We don't have to guess about things. So in Mark 15, 4, 15, we see, And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in our hearts. Now, you may have known someone who heard the truth about Jesus. You may have witnessed to someone like that yourself. And they thought, boy, that sounds really neat. But then, boom, you don't see them anymore. You can't get them interested in anything. That's because it didn't get, take, have time to take root. And Satan used all of his wiles to draw them away. Now... This type of hearer, we probably don't have them in here. They may have come for the, the first session in an evangelistic series or something of that nature, but after that, you didn't see them because right away, Satan got to them. I remember witnessing to a, a man in Arizona. He saw something different in me, and he wanted it. And I got him to come to church. And he came in and he sat down with his wife, but they were gone before the service started. It just wasn't for him. He was this type of hearer along the wayside because he didn't want to find out the truth about it. Now let's go to another verse, Mark 4, 16. And look at our stony ground. And these are they likewise which are stone on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately received it with gladness. Now these people responded, didn't they? This is fantastic. This is a wonderful thing. I want to hear more about this. 
But in verse 17, it says, And they have no root in themselves, so endure, but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises, for, for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Now, what does that mean? That means if you're witnessing for Christ, there's going to be persecution. There's going to be affliction. And if you get offended when somebody says something to you about your belief in Jesus, if they start to persecute you, aha, you can't be doing that around here. Sabbath's off? No, no way are we going to do that. Or they might get worse. If you talk about Scripture and what God says should happen in their lives, they don't want to hear it, and they want you out of there. Especially now with the gay agenda, we know in, in uh, Canada there are pastors locked up for talking against the gays. That's hate speech. They don't understand. It's love speech. God wants them in heaven, and, and homosexuality is an abomination, so they can't make it. So brother, sister, come out of it and go to heaven where you'll live happy for eternity. Oh, that's hate speech. That's what they think. They have no root in themselves and so endure for a time afterward when affliction or persecution arise for the word's sake. Immediately are they offended. It doesn't have to be that way. If you are in that group, turn from the temptations. Jesus said in Philippians 2.12, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And I got out of sync here someplace. I apologize. Was it in the previous one? No. Somehow I'm, I'm miss, missing a slide here. No, there it is. How did it get by it? Ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. To him that knocketh it shall be opening. Now what does this tell us? Does this tell us all we have to do is pray the sinner's prayer and it's a done deal? No, it doesn't. You notice, it's asking us. We've got to ask. We've got to seek. We've got to knock. We've got to do something. It takes a response, action on our part to, do, to uh, take advantage of of those things that Jesus has for us. Now we go to Philippians 2.12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now those that you consider yourself on good ground, I have a question for you. What are you doing for those that are on stony ground? Because I'll guarantee you there are some stony ground hearers in this sanctuary today. They are here because they love the Lord. But we're going to be facing persecution when the time of trouble deepens. And notice I said deepens because it has started. We've gotten into it. You can tell by the things that are going on in the world around us. Jesus gave us our marching orders. This is not just for the pastors. 
This is for everyone. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing the name in the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. Now, all the denominations say that they're doing that, don't they? And that's why they say that all you have to do is say a prayer and it's done. But he finishes that up with verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. He's going to be with us. He's going to strengthen us. He's going to empower us. But we need to go out and teach these people. We need to help them out so that they will draw closer to Jesus. We need to teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. If we are doing the work that God has appointed for us to accomplish, there will be persecution in our lives. Are you spiritually prepared for that? That's what you have to ask yourself. What's it going to be like and what am I going to do? Do you believe you're going to be persecuted? Jesus said so. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. So they can listen to him and follow what you say. They can reject him and persecute you. Do you feel you're ready for that? There's going to be three phases of the Sunday law. And believe me, I believe it's not going to be long before we see it. It's already being pushed in Europe. And we know the Pope is coming here later on this year. He's addressing the United Nations, and he has a private meeting with not just President Obama, but President and Mrs. Obama. And I can almost guarantee you one of the topics is going to be give the families a day where they can fellowship with one another. He's not going to say they've got to go to church. It's going to start with just, we need a family time. People need to draw together. People need time away from work. And that's how they're pushing it in Europe, and that's going to be how it starts here. But there's three phases of the Sunday law when it comes in. And the second phase is economic sanctions. When they tell you you can't buy or sell unless you have the mark, is your faith in the Lord strong enough to see you through at that time? It needs to be. The only way to do it is right here. Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Is it your highest priority to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness in your life? In the Old Testament, Ezekiel in chapter 36, verse 26, says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, that ye may keep my judgments and do them. That's a lot of work for you to do, isn't it? No. Look at it. He will give you the new heart. He will give you the new spirit. He will take away the stony heart. He will give you a heart of flesh. 
He will put a new spirit in you, and he will cause you to walk in his statutes and judgments. Isn't that good news? What do we have to do? We have to give him our will. Lord, I want you. Come into my heart. Make these changes. I want to be more like Jesus. So what are your priorities? Could some of those stony, stony ground receivers be among us today? I fear that to be the case. Now, if I'm wrong, forgive me and educate me. Tell me. What are you studying? And when are you studying it? In my way of thinking, the church in study, which we call Sabbath school, is possibly more important than this worship hour right now, where somebody's just talking to you. Because when we dig into God's Word, that's when it makes a difference in us. When we look at His Word and meditate upon it, that's when it changes our lives. And yet, I have taught Sabbath schools all across this country, and I have seen those that are in the Sabbath school class not even taking the time to prepare for the class. Now, if those that are interested in studying on Sabbath morning haven't taken any time during the week, what about all those who don't come in until the church service? Oh, 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 wait, Brother Tom, you don't know what kind of a week I've had. You know, I don't care what kind of a week you've had. You don't know what kind of a week I've had. The last two weeks, Satan has tried to crush me so that this message couldn't come to you. But I found time for it. Matter of fact, he had me rewriting it at 4 o'clock this morning. So don't give me your excuses. You can't find five minutes a day to read a Sabbath school lesson or five minutes a day to look at the Bible or five minutes a day to pray. You start out with those three things and it'll expand. If you're not doing those things, when somebody is out there that needs to hear about this word, you're not going to have it. You're not going to be strong enough to feed them. Now, <clears throat> it's totally up to you what you do. It's all up to your will. But this parable tells us that if you are not doing it, the results are dire. You're not going to make it. Now let's talk about the seed that fell on stony ground. I believe that uh, Dr. Luke gave us the best description of what transpires in Luke 8:14. And that which fell among the thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. This is the one that is most prevalent in our world today. We want to know about Jesus. We love to hear about Jesus. And that's why many are here on Sabbath morning. They want to hear about Jesus. But Satan's active in their lives. I shudder for our young people today. Look at the temptations they have that I didn't have. I was just telling my grandson yesterday about, uh, I forget how it came up, but tiddlywinks. You know, remember the little game? You punched on the little plastic thing and tried to get it in a cup? Times were simpler back then. Now all they want to do is sit in front of these video games or watch movies. They want to be entertained all the time. And... Satan has something for everybody and he wants to draw you away with it. Now, when it comes to work, 
Do we need to provide for our families? Absolutely. Are Christians forbidden to have fun? No, not at all. But with these hearers, neglect, total neglect, is the problem. They make their work their priority. They make their entertainment their priority. Anything is a priority rather than God. And we are told to seek ye first the kingdom of God. And these have allowed the temptations of Satan to occupy their time and resources so that there just is not enough time for Jesus. Now they have progressed further than the stony ground hearers, but have not developed that experimental relationship with Christ that deepens our faith and brings forth spiritual fruit. Without spiritual fruit, we can't profit the kingdom of heaven. And that's why we're here, is to profit heaven. We're here to finish the work so we can go home. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of the people that are dying, the people that are ill, the people that are suffering in the world today. I want to go where there's no more of that. Let's talk about the good ground. But they on good ground stand for those which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth the fruit with patience. Now, Brother Peter and Phyllis read to us this morning, and I believe if I caught it right, that was the NIV, wasn't it? The New International Version. New International Version says, but the seed on good uh, soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by what? Persevering. Whoa, persevering, produce a crop. Now, if you're not even taking five minutes a day in God's Word, if you're not taking five minutes a day to pray with Him, are you persevering? I can't see how you are, but this is a great way to measure our walk with the Lord, isn't it? Good soil produces a crop. What crop are you producing? Do you see any progress in your spiritual walk? Now, I don't profess to be a good gardener by any stretch of the imagination. I ask people like Dennis questions all the time about it. It takes a lot of work to grow a good garden, and you must persevere to bring forth good fruit. As a spiritual gardener, perhaps I can help my neighbor get rid of the stones or thorns that are in their lives. After all, Jesus told us a new commandment. I have given unto you that ye love one another as what? As I have loved you. What was he willing to do for you? Die for us. So that ye also love one another. That tells me I am my brother's keeper. I am to watch out for others. And I believe it's not just me, but anybody else here is, should be in the same way. Now, on the back of your bulletin in the meditation, we have Colosh, uh, Christ Object Lessons 59, pay, uh, paragraph 5, which says, Merely to hear or to read the word is not enough. He who desires to be profited by the scriptures must meditate upon the truth that has been presented to him by earnest attention and prayerful thought. He must learn the meaning of the words of truth and drink deep of the spirit of the holy oracles. Isn't that beautiful? The second paragraph says, merely to hear or to read the word is not enough. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I went right back on it. God bids us fill the mind with great thoughts, 
pure thoughts. His desire, he, excuse me, he desires us to meditate upon his love and mercy, to study his wonderful work in the great plan of redemption. Then clearer and still clearer will be our perception of truth, higher, holier, our desire for purity of heart and clearness of thought. The soul dwelling in the pure atmosphere of holy thought will be transformed by communion with God through the study of His scriptures. Do you see what you're losing out on when you're not into His Word? His Word is meant to be a blessing for us. Now, those of you who are on good ground have a responsibility to be teaching others. We're supposed to teach them what it said in Matthew 28, 20, to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Those of you who are on stony and thorny ground, you need to be seek ye first the kingdom of God. You need to be doing something. They need to be doing something. Together we do it. And so if you're in one of those lesser groups, look for a mentor. There are many people in this church that will guide you closer to the Lord. And you've heard me say it before. It would do you well to be in study groups. I'd like to see everyone in this church in a study group. They are a blessing. That being said, you have to answer a question in your own heart. And that's where we started out. Why are you here? Is it just to warm a pew? I hope not. But if it's anything less than reflecting the character of Christ in your own life, that your Father in heaven may be glorified, you may be here for the wrong reason. Because glorifying God is the reason we're here. And if that's the case, that you're not doing that, you will not be satisfying his goal for your life. And that will be sad indeed. Amen.